you have your Bibles and you're in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, I'd like to uh, read a couple of verses here concerning some of the hardships of ministry that the Apostle Paul faced and uh, some of the things that he went through and how he describes that. But before we get into that, let me give you the title here again, which is Counting the Cost. This is a, a part two of a message I started last week, Counting the Cost. And uh, that title phrase comes from a scripture verse uh, in Luke chapter 14, verse 28, where it says, For which of you intending to build? Tell that person beside you, I'm a builder. We've got to build our Christian life, right? We've got to lay a foundation. We've got to dig deep, lay the right foundation, and then build on that foundation. But which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? And uh, there you have that phrase, counting the cost. And this is, I'd love to read this. We did it last week, and I don't have time to go there today. But uh, this is right at a time where Jesus' ministry is at an apex as far as the amount of people that are following him. This is before real resistance came from the Sanhedrin council, the Pharisees, the religious people of his day. There were thousands that were following Jesus uh, up to this point in his ministry. And things are about to go the other way, where he begins to call for uh, a greater commitment to those who are his disciples. And this is the beginning of that call. And you'll notice that after this, that the thousands aren't following him anymore. But it's getting narrowed down to a few faithful that are following him. And as he's at this apex where these multitudes are following him, he turns around and he says to the multitudes, he says, I need you to count the cost if you want to continue to follow me. And he begins to talk to them about before you become my disciple. Now, how many of you know there's a difference between being a believer and being a disciple? See, you enter into salvation, it's a free gift. But if you want to be a disciple of Jesus, there's a cost to it. And if you want to become a Christian, right, you don't do that by a parrot confession at an altar. You do that by first becoming a believer. The word Christian means to be an anointed one. So you begin by becoming a believer, and then you pay the price as a disciple. And then God puts His glory and anointing on you, and you become a Christian. It's a process, folks. And unfortunately, we have cheapened the word Christian in our generation. It means to be an anointed one, to be Christ-like. And uh, there's a process to really becoming that true Christian. And so... Jesus is challenging the multitudes with this. Okay, before you become my disciple, I need you to count the cost. I need you to consider the requirement that's associated with that. And he's putting some requirements out there. He's saying things like, I have to be more important than your family. I need to mean more to you than father, mother, sister, or brother. And he's saying things like, I need you to be willing to bear your cross, your cross, your cross. And then he uses expressions like, I need you to forsake all if you want to be my disciple. Notice the conditions, the requirements. And he talks about things in context with this, about the servants not greater than the master. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. If they called me Beelzebub. Uh, uh, the, the prince of the devils by the power that I was using. They'll probably accuse you of that too. So there's a cost to going all the way with God. I know that's not heard much today anymore. This used to be mainstay preaching 20, 30 years ago in the church 50 years ago. But it's been softened. And so now we get over to 2 Corinthians chapter 6 where I want to I read from today. And Jesus in Luke 14, he was looking ahead to what his disciples would face. Saying, this is what you're going to have to pay the price for if you want to go all the way with me. But 
Paul here in 2 Corinthians 6 is now looking back at some of the things he's been through, saying this is what it means to be a true disciple, to be a true son or daughter, to go all the way with God. And so let's read it. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 3. First thing he says, don't give offense in anything. This word offense, and what it's telling us is we're not to offend other people. Now that word offend has nothing to do with the modern interpretation of offend like we see it. But what it's talking about is you as a child of God, the word offense has to do with sinning against someone else. Don't sin against someone else. It has nothing to do with not offending people. Because you will be an offense to people if you go all out for God. You will be. You may offend your father, mother, sister, brother. Your own family. The Pharisees around you. You probably will offend them. And some of that might be family. It's okay. It's not okay, but it is okay. Because Jesus makes it okay and gives us grace for that. And so Jesus is looking ahead. Paul's looking back at his own life. And he's giving a warning to future disciples. This is what it looks like. Picking it up in... And he says, don't give an offense because I don't want the ministry to be blamed. But he says in verse 4, in all things, approve yourself. Approving ourselves as ministers of God in much patience. (laughs) You know what that word means? It's actually a fruit of the Spirit. The more of the Holy Ghost you have, the more patience you should have. In afflictions. In necessities. You know the Apostle Paul, great man of faith that he was, there was times where he needed things. And those times where he needed things may have been drug out for a period before he received them. That's why you need patience. In necessities. In distresses. In stripes. Forty times less, or five times I received forty stripes minus one so they could do it to me again. And that was a cat of nine tails that left your back looking like hamburger. He was stoned. He was beaten. In in, in imprisonments, he says. In tumults. In labors. In watchings. In fastings. By pureness. By knowledge. By long-suffering. By kindness. By the Holy Ghost. By love unfeigned. No pretense, right? By the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. By honor, dishonor, by evil report and good report. See, there's going to be good times in the Christian life. Christian walk. We rejoice in those times. But there's going to be hardships. Times of suffering. But you know what we do then? We rejoice also. We keep worshiping God. Keep our eyes on Jesus. By honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true. Have you ever been accused of being a deceiver? I have. But I was true as I was doing it. As unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing all things. Wow, the paradoxes of the Christian life. You walk in the blessings of God, but you also experience what everybody else around you does. It's called life. And you may experience it at higher levels than people around you because you're a target. But you keep your focus on Jesus. You realize this is part of the deal. This is part of me taking up my cross These things are required of me as a man of God to face these things with honor and faithfulness and integrity. And as we continue on in this chapter, and I don't have time to read it, the Apostle Paul begins to point out the need for the believer to be separated from idolatry, from immorality, from immoral things and an immoral lifestyle. And the idolatry and this separation, he says, will lead you into becoming my sons and my daughters. 
Notice he puts a condition on that. We can become believers, but to become a son, you've got to separate yourself from idolatry and immorality. And he begins to talk about what it takes to become a temple of the Holy Spirit. And as you get down into verse 18, he places these conditions of sonship upon us. So what did Paul mean by all these things that I just threw out at you? What did Jesus mean when he said, you need to bear your cross? Not bear my cross, bear your cross. You bear your cross. Thank God we don't have to bear the cross of Christ. Man, he had a hard cross to bear. Everything he did from Gethsemane man on, I don't want to go through that. But that was his cross to bear. But I've got one to bear too. You've got one to bear too. And yours may not look like mine. Mine may not look like yours. And neither of ours may look like Jesus. In every detail and sense of the word. But it's a cross. What did Jesus mean by bearing your cross? What did he mean by forsaking all? What did he mean by the servants not greater than the master? See, all of us here have been exposed to internet coming into the home and now we have access to so many things through YouTube and all of that and for those of us who are Christians who use that as a venue to tap into the gospel that's being preached out there we've all been affected by what I call the modern gospel the modern gospel message and maybe there's truths in the modern gospel that they didn't have 50 or 100 years ago. Maybe they've got revelations that they didn't have back then. And I give room for all of that. And I'm not here to condemn any and all modern gospel preachers. But I'll say within the context of what we call the modern gospel, uh, it's a message where it costs you nothing. And I have a problem with that. Where it costs you nothing to serve Jesus. And that's been shrouded by a wrong emphasis on grace and mercy. A false grace message, a cheap grace. Bert Clendenin told us there's a cheap grace that's being sold in the marketplace of religion. It's true. And in order for the grace that God puts on you not to be considered cheap, you've got to count the cost. Have you counted the cost? And this, this modern day message where the gospel costs us nothing kind of seems to work in our western world of democracy and freedom. Kind of seems to work. But in reality it doesn't. It's a disillusion. It's a delusion. of. It's a false message. And it's going to become more real in the future as we continue to lose these freedoms. But yes, there is a price to pay to go all out for Jesus. There is a cost to it. But when you come to the cross of Jesus, now, we go to the cross of Jesus. We go there. And when we go to the cross of Jesus, He meets us, and He offers us our own cross. He wants us to take our cross and carry it. And like I said before, our cross is different from His cross. And my cross is different from your cross. But we all have a cross to bear. And the cross is not a piece of jewelry you wear around your neck. It's not something you pray to. It's not something you hang on your wall at home that's been glorified and beautified. By some wrong... Imp the cross was a death mechanism. It was designed to kill you. And when Jesus offers you a cross, when you come to the cross of Jesus, He's there to meet you and He says, what I did for you is a free gift. But now I have something I want to give you. And I want you to carry this. Wherever you go, I want you to take your cross upon yourself. And it's a death mechanism, and its intent is to kill you. Thank God that Jesus 
doesn't want us to stay the way we were. He wants us to die. He wants us to crucify the flesh. And you can't crucify yourself. You imagine Jesus trying to get up on that cross and, you know, he, he runs the nail through his feet and then he puts his one hand up. He might get that done by kind of holding the nail, but he gets to this part here. Why, you know, all of a sudden you're running out of hands and legs. And you don't crucify yourself, but you take up the cross. And then Jesus sends people along to crucify you. Isn't Christian life fun? <laughs> Isn't it wonderful? But when you come to the cross of Jesus, He offers you your cross to bear. And your cross is intended to put you to death. Now, salvation is a free gift. Come on, folks, it doesn't cost us anything. And the gifts of God are free. And the goodness of God is free. And once we take on a mentality that we have to do this and this and this to earn it, that's a religious spirit. You want to get delivered from that. So these things are free, and the message of come as you are is true. It's right. These doors are open to anyone that wants to come, regardless of the baggage. The kingdom of God is open to everyone that wants to come. Regardless of the past. And so bring your baggage. Come. Welcome to the kingdom of heaven. But once you're there, there's a cross. Jesus meets you with a cross. And upon entry into the kingdom of heaven, He gives you a cross, and that cross represents a death to the old nature. That cross represents the need for Jesus to be number one in your life. That cross represents you forsaking all, all, A-L-L, to follow Him, if need be. If need be, you're willing to forsake it all. He may not ask you to do it. He may not ask you to do what He asked the rich young ruler to do. But then again, He may. He has the right to determine what means more to you than Him and put His finger on that. He has the right to do that. That has to do with the cross, the message of the cross. And so we come to Him, we've got all this baggage, we've got all this garbage, and the cross is a garbage dump. We cast our sins upon the cross of Jesus. Our baggage, our generational iniquities and curses and bondages and strongholds and roots of bitterness and all of that. And He wants them all. And He says, unless you're willing to forsake them all, you cannot be My disciple. Notice it's not a salvation issue. It's a discipleship issue. And listen to this. True sons. Have we got any here? True daughters will consider the cost of all of this. They'll think about it. Okay. If I do this, it's going to cost me something. But they'll also consider the benefits. And at the end, upon considering the costs and considering the benefits, they will gladly embrace the cross that Jesus wants them to carry. And that's where I need you to get to. See, many of us gladly embrace the cross without considering the cost. And then down the road a year or two, things get hard. Remember the story I shared with you last weekend, 20 years ago. I use the term chicken house. It was a Bible study and a remodeled chicken house that we were holding back in those days. And it was before I walked through any type of persecution and resistance to any major extent. We had a man of God in there preaching one night. He's talking about the things of the Spirit and had an altar call. And this friend of mine that I had invited to be there from another state in another church setting responded to the altar call and he said these words, I don't care what it costs, I want everything that God has for me. And I thought, man, that's a, 
pretty neat thing for a Christian to say. I don't care what it costs. But you know, I would never say those words today. Because I care what it costs. I do. I've learned to consider the cost. And the price that I've had to pay for some of the things that we're seeing in our circles today is a high price. And the price that we need to pay to see some of the things that God wants to do in the future, there's a price to it. There's a cost to it. We ought to consider the cost this morning. You ought to consider the cost that comes with your calling. And you ought to do it now before you get too far into this thing because you might come down the road a year or two and say, man, I didn't realize the price was this steep. See, this is a gospel that's not preached in the church today. The Word of Faith movement, and, and uh, it's about, it has become in the church today, unfortunately, it's become, what can I get out of God? What can I go to the kingdom of God for and get out of Him? And I'll tell you, there are benefits, and we need to look at the benefits, and we need to preach the benefits, and we need to impart and release the benefits to our people, but we need to, we need to tell them about the cross. Because people get into this a year or two, and they don't realize the price. But this guy said, I don't care what it costs, I want everything God has for me. And I remember Brother Rhodes looking at him and saying, are you sure? <laughs> Then he said it again, are you sure? This guy was nodding his head. And Brother Rhodes did what he should have done, laid his hands on him, blessed him, prayed for him, asked the Lord to release the goodness of God upon him, and God did. But you know, a year or two later, somebody said, you know what happened with so-and-so? He's in immorality today. He's not serving God. Giving up on the Lord. I don't care what it costs. Listen, there is a price. There is a cost. You ought to consider it this morning. I believe the Lord wants us to consider the cost this morning. The true sons and daughters consider the cost, they consider the benefits, and they gladly take up the cross. How many of you would like a greater anointing upon your life? How many of you would like more revelation of God's truth about who He is and what His Word says? Me too. How many of you would like a greater spiritual authority over things in the natural and the demonic realm? Me too. How many of you would like a greater measure of God's favor? See, I talked to you about all these things last week, but did you know there's a cost to them? There was a cost to the favor of God that was upon Jacob. There was a cost when, when uh, Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 19 sends out handkerchiefs and people are being delivered and being set free and being healed from demons and sicknesses and diseases. And, and then you go to the next verse or two, the seven sons of Sceva said, if God can do it for Paul, he can do it for us. And they try to exercise it, the same spiritual authority, and it doesn't work so well for them. They've not paid the price that the Apostle Paul pay, paid, and they probably weren't saved. And I'm not saying you have to pay a price to get any kind of victory in your life, but I'm saying as you pursue the things of God with your whole heart, there's going to be a cost to it. Because these are free gifts. The anointing is a free gift. Truth is a free gift. True freedom, getting into your... But there's a price to pay. It's a paradox that's hard to wrap our head around, but it has to do with these things freely. The Lord wants to give them to us, but as we enter into them, as we walk in these things, there's also going to be a resistance from the world system, maybe the religious system around us, and the spirit realm. But Satan doesn't want you to have these things. And so we have to recognize that there's a cost. They're going all the way with the Lord. And if you want a greater anointing in your life, it may mean you have to face, number one, we talked about this last weekend, 
And I think it's all the further I got. It may mean rejection. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on this thing of rejection because I talked about it last weekend. But you know what's interesting is being able to face rejection without taking on a spirit of rejection. Because you're not a victim. You're a son, you're a daughter of the King, the Most High God. He is your Father. And if you're rejected for His name's sake, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting Him. And so we've got to face rejection without becoming a victim. It's true. Sons and daughters are not victims. They're more than conquerors. And so, the second thing here, if you want these things, a greater anointing, a greater revelation of His truth, a greater spiritual authority, greater favor, greater freedom, you want to get into your calling, you want to go all the way with God, it may mean you'll face suffering. May mean may mean. I'm not speaking these things over you. I'm not in agreement with you suffering. I don't want to see it happen. I don't want to suffer any more than what I have. But I also know that there's something called life, and suffering is a part of life in this world. And I also know that suffering is a part of the sold out Christian life. And I don't think we should be in agreement with it, but I believe we need to prepare for it. Brace ourselves. You know, I've asked God for things over the years. And I didn't quite realize what I was asking Him for. And His answer wasn't no. And some of the things that I've asked Him for are the things we're seeing today. Things we're seeing today in our circle of churches... The testimonies coming out of Operation Metamorphosis are things I've prayed for for 20 years. Do you know when I first asked God for them? His response was, I need you to walk through this first. Well, I don't want to do that. And it wasn't that this was necessarily coming from the Lord. It was that He wanted me to walk through it. See, there's a difference. I believe that this curse that this world's under is inspired by Satan, the God of this world. Afflictions and suffering is because of the God of this world. Who has lost the war? God wants us to enforce it, but He wants us to walk through times of suffering. And come out the other side. The Bible calls it a fiery trial. Now, you can take all of Peter and throw it out and say, that's not a part of my gospel, but you only got a partial gospel. And you're going to find in this thing called life, if you're going to go all out with God, there's going to come a point where that gospel ain't working. And so we need the words of Peter, First and Second Peter, where he talks about fiery trials. We need that. And there's been times in my life where all I could do is get on my face before God, say, Lord, let this which is happening to me do that which you want it to do in my life. And as you walk through times of suffering, you're going to come through having experienced the death. Right? That's what the cross has been designed to do. Bring you to a place of brokenness. But it's in that place of brokenness that the Lord can raise you up in resurrection power. Listen, you will not come to the fullness of resurrection power without taking up your cross. You may experience it. The Lord may allow you to taste of it because He wants you to see that He is good. Taste and see for the Lord is good. He may let you experience things in a corporate anointing. But if you want to walk in the fullness of the Holy Ghost, you've got to be prepared to take up your cross and allow it to bring the death that God wants it to bring in you. Death to wrong motives. Death to arrogance. And pride. Death to the things that I want. And having those things replaced with the things that He wants. 
That's what this cross represents. You know, suffering is a reality in the third world. Maybe much more so than it is in our Western world. Let me just put it this way. God finds different ways to do it here. Last time I was in Mexico, I think I was down with Brother Dave and Brother Joe. A couple of years ago, back in the mountains of Oaxaca, we had a service. And they brought to me, service was great. God was moving. I thought everything was great. They sat down, sat us down after the service to this. Man, it was a spread for a king. In a mountain village of Oaxaca where they don't have hardly any money. They laid out a spread for a king because they wanted to honor the man of God that was there and his team. And I thought it was great. But about three quarters of the way through that meal, they brought this young Indian woman, probably about the age of my daughter Shana there, two or three children. They brought her to me. They said, would you pray for her? They said, just two days ago, the cartel came in. Her husband was a pastor. And he wasn't cooperating with the local powers that be, known as the cartel. They took him out in front of her. She watched her husband die. This is real life down there. There was a man in that service that day came up to me weeping, tears streaming down his face, said, pray for me. I watched my pastor get killed. This was another man that just got killed recently. I watched my pastor die. As a cartel came in through the front door of our church and opened up fire with an AK-47. Put a dozen bullet holes in it. See, this is suffering. Why did they have to go through that? I, I don't know. I was in India. The one of the last times I was in India, Brother Paulus, Moses Paulus is a man that's preached the gospel there for 50 plus years. And he's now at a place where he's over hundreds of churches. And he's been blessed in so many different ways. And Literally, through his ministry, there's millions of dollars get funneled through his hands. So they have an orphanage and multiple schools and do a tremendous work for Jesus. But despite all those blessings of Abraham, right? He told me as recent as a year ago, this last time I talked to him, I was beaten. For preaching the name of Jesus. It's called suffering. And as he was sharing with our group. I think this was the first visit over there. He went to the scripture in Peter. Where Peter says have a mind to suffer. Do you have a mind to suffer? Now I know you haven't heard this before in the church. Because it's not preached today. It's, it's preached in our circles. But do you have a mind to suffer? You know what that means? Have you braced yourself? Or, you know, I don't want suffering. I don't want it. I don't want it for you and I don't want it for my family. But have you prepared yourself that when it comes, you're going to do it well? You're going to do it with excellence? It's easy to say, I'm all in. I have decided, right? I got issues with that song. I told you that last week. Because it's being sung by people who haven't considered the cost. They haven't counted the cost. China, just recently, Brother Pepper contacted me. He said, this husband was a pastor and he was a part of our work and they started being followed and 
she was translating for us and he was preaching and they found out about it and they knew they were being followed but they decided they're going to keep serving God and now they've taken the husband. We don't know where he's at. He's been gone for months. We can't find him. We don't know if he's alive or dead but that's just what they do over there in those communist nations. They just come in, they take you and you disappear. You might be in prison up in Siberia somewhere. Um but there's no contact and they do that to intimidate, put fear in the church and despite all of that, the church continues to grow. And they're praying that we would see what they're seeing so that we could experience what true Christianity is all about. You say, not me. <laughs> I don't want any of that. Right? The other one I'll throw at you, if you want these things, you want to experience these good things of God. You want to go all the way with God. You may have to endure hardship. Notice I'm throwing the word may out there. Because I don't know what your cross is. I just know you have a cross. And so do I. And it may include hardship. Well, I don't want any of that. Do you want to get to the place where true brokenness has really impacted you to the point where the old man has been crucified and now the new resurrection power can arise. There's a cost to that. The Apostle Paul said part of the cost was afflictions, distresses, stripes, imprisonment, fastings. I ain't going to do that. Jesus said some of these won't come out, but by fasting and prayer. And it's not that we do these things so that they come out. It's that we do these things so we can have a closer relationship with Jesus. Intimacy with God. And then he begins to talk about being stoned and perils of robbers and a night and a day in the deep and Perils of my countrymen, and perils of heathen, and perils in the wilderness, and perils in the city, and the danger that he walked through to go all out and be called to the Lord. How many of you are glad you don't have Paul's cross to bear? I'm glad. You know, I don't want to do that. I don't want to spend a night and a day in the deep. I can't swim that good. And I don't like sharks. I swam with uh, sharks two weeks ago. They were the nice nurse sharks. They were nice to me. That's as long as I want to be in the deep with a shark. That was his cross. And it may not be your cross, but guess what? You've got a cross, and that cross is designed to bring death to you. So that you can experience something called brokenness. Brokenness is beautiful. It's amazing. It's our only hope, folks. And you can reject it. You can reject your cross. And I think there's some things we need to reject. But I also think we need to soldier up. Salute. You need to learn to salute. Part of Operation Metamorphosis was to learn how to salute. Only broken people know how to salute to the Holy Ghost. You're not truly broken, you'll have your own agendas. And your saluting will always have a wrong motive behind it. And it doesn't work. That's why we need the cross of the Lord Jesus. He says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse, verses, or chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in what? Grace. See, when you consider the cross, then there's a grace that the Lord wants to release upon you so you can take up your cross. And if you haven't considered the cross, the grace becomes a cheap thing. But as you consider, you know, there are some things I'm going to have to face, but I need some grace to do it. I can't do it on my own strength. I need the grace of God. And you seek God for grace, and then you can be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. 
Verse 2, And the things that you have heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit to who? Faithful men. Have we got any faithful men and women here this morning? Jesus said, Shall I find faith when I return to the earth? It's an end time message. He wasn't talking about faith to raise the dead. He was talking about faithfulness. He wasn't talking about faith for signs and wonders and miracles and healings. He was talking about faithfulness. See, there's two kinds of faith we need to have. We need to have a faith for those things, but we also need faithfulness. One's a gift of the Spirit. The other one's a fruit of the Spirit. This one makes this one work better. This one produces this. But without this, this becomes obnoxious. You get off. There's wrong motives, wrong agendas. And you won't be in for the duration, for the long haul. And you'll say things like, I don't care what it costs, but a year or two later you'll be in immorality. We need faithfulness, folks. Verse 3. The same commit to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Notice, this is discipleship, teaching. You walk in it, and you teach others how to walk in it. I love the message of this brother. And the Lord gave me the same one. He gave me a word concerning this end time revival. He said it's going to be, it's not just going to be one man. The Spirit of the Lord is going to be poured out on many. All who are willing And you're not going to need a priest to get to the Lord and into the presence of God. But folks, don't let that rob you of this true discipleship message. Which is, as you walk faithful, the Lord will anoint you to teach others to be faithful. We still need fathers in the house of God. We still need the apostolic anointing. But he says in the next verse, verse 3, Thou therefore endure hardness. I'm not in agreement with you going through hardship. I want life to be nice to you. But if it shows up, endure it. Man up, soldier up. Put on some armor. Walk through it. You can do it. You can do it because of the grace in verse 1. Endure hardness. Hardship. More modern word. As a good soldier of Jesus Christ, no man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of life. What is that? You need to find out what that is for you. It may look a little different. I quoted this verse in Mexico with a bunch of Indian pastors at a pastor's conference in, in Oaxaca one time. And what this meant to them is they weren't allowed to work as pastors but had to have faith. So none of them had jobs. And those who had jobs, which they all kind of were farmers in disguise, you know, because they didn't want their people to know they were working. They felt beat up and condemned because this verse was preached that a pastor shouldn't have a job. Well, we need to stop painting with a broad brush, right? And we need to teach people how to seek God for themselves and find out what this verse means for them. And different people are different places in life. And the cross the Lord has you bear now may look different from the one that He has you bear in five years from now. No man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who has chosen him to be what? You're chosen. You're chosen to be a child of God. You're chosen to be a son of God. But you're chosen to be a soldier. And with that may come some hardship. Some battles. And number four, these things may mean that you'll be persecuted. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 says, Yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall, shall, shall suffer persecution.
I've been blessed beyond measure, folks. I have not experienced what they're experiencing in Oaxaca, Mexico. I have not experienced what I saw man in India experience where they cut off his arm and then his leg and were about to cut off his head because he was a Christian. That was his only sin, his only violation. And I met that man, they st- he, somehow it got stopped as they were cutting through the back of his neck. And no arm, no leg, still serving Jesus though. And I, I can't relate to that because I've not experienced that. But I want to say today, I've gone all out for Jesus. I've lived godly for Christ Jesus. And I know what it's like to face persecution. And I believe if you're going to plug into this church and sell out for the Lord, you'll face the same thing. This is step number one on how not to build a mega church. Tell them there's a cross. Tell them they may be persecuted. I know what it's like to have my name cast as evil. I know what it's like to be rejected and to be lied about and to be misunderstood and to have all manner of evil spoken about me just simply because I was serving Jesus with my whole heart. How do you respond to that? You know what you do? You say, thank you for the cross. Lord Jesus, thank you for the cross. Help me to bear my cross. Thank you for what that cross is designed to do in me. I allow it to do what you want it to do. But I choose to forgive. I choose to release those whom you've allowed to crucify me. Amen. The Bible says leap for joy when they say all manner of evil about you. Try jumping up and down the next time. Instead of getting mad at them, try jumping up and down. It works. And number five, these things may mean that you'll become a target. I don't think we should major on this stuff, but I think we ought to know it. Revelation 12, 12 says, Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you. When is this? It's Revelation, the end times. Having great wrath because he knows he has but a short time. Apparently, as we get closer to the return of Jesus... There's more pressure on the devil to mess up the church because he knows his time is being shortened so there's more potential for this to increase, the great wrath to increase in the latter days. But the good news is simultaneously in the last days there will be an outpouring of God's Spirit. In the church I grew up in, we all, all we ever heard was the negative stuff that's going to happen. Let me tell you, there's some good things that are going to happen in the latter days too. God's going to pour His Spirit out upon all flesh. Especially His sons and daughters. Four years ago, none of my daughters were filled with the Holy Ghost. And they'd been praying for it for years. And I said, Lord, what do I need to do to get my daughters filled with the Holy Ghost? And he gave us a group of, mem- of verses to memorize, and then we began to fast and pray and seek God. And then he said, I want you to do this, this, and this. And so I did this and this and this. And then on one night, all four of them got filled with the Holy Ghost, began to speak in tongues. That was from the oldest, 19, to the youngest, about nine, eight or nine. And then a year or so later, Josiah got it, my Five or six year old. That's not fair. How's that fair to my 19 year old that she has to wait till she's 19 and the young fella gets it at six? That's not fair. But I got news for you. Sometimes life is not fair. And you know, through our network of churches, right through us going through one of the greatest times of shaking that we've ever experienced in our network came the greatest outpouring of the Holy Ghost 
that I've ever been a part of. And I mean, it just began to spread as we went through the churches. Now, here was the condition. You had to be young, and you had to be a female. <laughs> I'd open up the altars for the Holy Ghost. We'd have young and old come up, boys and girls. And the only ones getting it was the girls. This went on for one year, man. I laid my hands on girls as young as five, six, seven, eight years old. They get the Holy Ghost. Man, I just put my hands on them. They just start speaking in tongues. Lay my hands on a guy is like laying hands on a rock. Nothing happened. This, this brother here said something about God doing uh, something in a peculiar way. It wasn't peculiar. I forget what the word was. But th God does some strange things. Why did he do it that way? I think he was after those guys' hearts. He's saying, you all need, need to consider the cost. You want what these girls have? There's a price to pay for that. You know, about a year later, I saw something rise up in, the, in, in these guys. I think I, you could call it faith or something, but it was with that faith was a determination. If the girls are going to get it, we're going to get it too. And with a jealousy, they went after this thing, and all of a sudden... I lay hands on the guys, they, they get it, one after another. Boom, boom, boom. I don't know why it takes people longer to get it than others. It took me a while to get it for some reason. But I know that there's something in that that the Lord's putting His finger on. And just because you got the Holy Ghost, somebody else doesn't, doesn't make you a better person than them. And it doesn't even make you more spiritual than them. Some of the most spiritual people I know are people that never had the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Some of the most immature Christians I ever met speak in tongues. That's not true across the board. but So don't justify yourself in one or the other. But we need God. And we need grace. And have you considered that Part of the costs that you might have to pay for the things that God is asking you to do, you might have to make some changes. That's number six. You might have to get sanctified. You might have to clean up your language. You might have to quit smoking cigarettes. You should have done that a while ago already. But if you haven't yet, do it now. You may have to quit with lust and pornography and those kinds of things and fornication. You know, I'm talking about discipleship today, but some of those things will actually keep you out of the kingdom. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Now remember, we read chapter 6. All these things that Paul said will happen to ministers, disciples... And then he talks about separation from idolatry and immorality. And then he says, if you do these things, you'll be my sons and daughters. And then you get to chapter 7, verse 1. Having therefore these promises. Which promises? Sons and daughter promises. What do we do? We cleanse ourselves. Wow. How do you clean yourself? You need the soap of the Holy Ghost. You need the washing of the water by the Word. We cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. See, this has to do with everything from character flaws to sin. Perfecting holiness in what? Come on, somebody tell me. Oh, brother, that's Old Testament. It's going to be part of the end time move of God. Without the fear of the Lord, we can't get everything God has for us. And then, the last one I want to give you here is, if you want everything God has for you, you want to go all the way with Him, you may have to meet some qualifications. You will have to meet some qualifications. The Bible says in Matthew 22, verse 14, Many are called, but 
fear chosen. And there's some things that he's going to ask you to do if you want to go all the way with him. There'll be some things he requires of you. Philippians 1.6 says this, Be confident in this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it. Everybody say perform it. That means carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15.10 says, By the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. The reason it wasn't in vain is grace to the Apostle Paul was not a cheap thing. It was there for a purpose. It was there for a reason. And he did. He maxed out the grace potential in his life. See, we can have grace on us and not do anything with it. It can be in vain. But we need to take the grace that God puts on us and fulfill that which He's called us to do and fulfill that which He's called us to be. And He said, I labored more abundantly than they all. Talking about the rest of the disciples. I got more done than the other 11 put together. Paul, you're bragging. No, no, it was a grace. The grace that was on my life. See, when you count the cost, Jesus meets you just inside the kingdom when you get there. You come there with all your baggage, all your garbage, all your agendas and motives and plans, all your friends and family that are applauding you on. How many of you have experienced that? You got saved and everybody was there rejoicing. And then you sell out and they're not sure what to make of this. My family was really glad I got saved when I got saved. Man, I come out of drugs. Out, you name it, I came out of it. And they were there applauding me on for the first six months. And then all of a sudden, it's like, slow this boy down. Because we're getting under conviction being around him. Listen, if the religious system around you is not resisting what you're doing, you're not sold out to God. You might be saved, but you're not sold out. And I want to say, we need to count the cost this morning. And when we count the cost, when Jesus meets us inside that kingdom with this cross, that's not a nice thing. It's not a piece of jewelry. It's not a picture on a wall. It's ugly. It's terrible. It's intended for one thing. That's your death. Your crucifixion. And as you consider the cross that Jesus wants you to bear, and you surrender, and you bow yourselves before Him, and you say, I'll take that cross, Lord Jesus. With that cross, He releases a grace. Folks, that's what you want. Grace is a free gift, but it doesn't come unless you accept the cross. This is this paradox. Brother Burt talks about the cheap grace in the marketplace of religion. He's right. We've cheapened this thing because we have downplayed the brutality of the death on the cross. 